Oh, the Bible, an unknown writer once penned that this book tells the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. Follow its precepts, and it will lead you to Calvary, to the empty tomb, to a resurrected life in Christ, yes, to glory itself for eternity. I don't believe any more eloquent words could be written by human hand depicting just how glorious and urgent and necessary the Bible is to the world and more specifically how glorious, urgent, and necessary the Bible is to the life and the work of the church. You see, when you examine the inner workings of the religious world at large, and many Christian religions in our world, likely what we would find is that in their inner workings and in their activities and ministries, if you will, very few of them would be dependent solely upon Bible authority. Rather, they would turn to manuals or creeds, catechisms, standards, and such like, which are written by mere men and have its origin solely within the minds of mere men. A few weeks ago, we began a series on Sunday mornings that we have been calling, What's the Difference? Because honestly, that is a question that many people in the religious world are asking themselves in their search of true religion. They might pull out the yellow pages in any given day and scroll through and look at see how many different churches, how many different religions are represented simply within their zip code. And they begin going down and reading through the list and not knowing really one from the other. They ask themselves, well, really, what is the difference between all of these different religions? And even more specifically, I believe we find in the minds of many people who may even have a greater understanding or knowledge of different religions when they look at some religions in the world versus the true religion that is outlined within the course of God's Word, then they ask themselves the question, what is the difference between those two? And the same conclusion to which we have come each of the weeks we have discussed this question is the difference is eternal. We began four weeks ago by asking the question, can it be the case that we can be religious, be sincere in that religion, have the greatest of intentions in that religion, and be wholly and fully devoted to that religion, and yet at the same time be wrong? And the answer to which the Bible comes, based on Acts chapter 17 and Paul's interaction with the 
devout religious Athenians is that you can be both religious and wrong. And then three weeks ago we moved into asking some more specific questions and referring to what's the difference with regard to the identity of the church. It's an eternal difference. What's the difference with regard to the worship of the church last week? And the answer is, it is an eternal difference. And this morning we ask, what about with regard to the creed or the authority of the church? What is the difference? Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, Paul began to identify what the difference is when you begin talking about the authority of the church of the Bible. He wrote to that congregation, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. That's a compliment. And to say here is a group of Christians who are obedient, but not just when there is an apostle present, because would it not have made sense for them to be obedient when the apostle was present? They certainly did not want to be disobedient when the apostle was present, lest they be sharply rebuked. But Paul said, not only were you obedient when I was present, but even so much more in my absence were you, pre or were you obedient. And so work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do whose good pleasure... Uh, here's the first reference to the true authority of the true church of the Bible. It has nothing to do with the will of man. In fact, if the authority by which the church of which I'm a member has anything to do with the will of man, that immediately tells me something about its true purpose and intention. Paul said the highest purpose to which we can attain is to work in us the will and the good pleasure of the God of heaven and Him alone, doing all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights of the world. How, Paul? How is it that you in the world, having to live in the world, can shine out from the world as a distinct and different people. Verse 16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain and neither labored in vain. You see, the standard that we are to reflect in our lives as the church that belongs to Christ is the word that pertains unto life. And now what word might it be to which Paul has reference that pertains unto life? Well, Peter had wrote, written in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3 that God has provided all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And Paul had earlier written in Romans 1 and verse 16 that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, which by the way is what? Eternal life. And so when Paul has reference to the devoted Christian reflecting the true standard of God in his life, and he refers to the word of life, that, friends, is the gospel the Bible, the Holy Word of God, inspired and revealed by God unto man, preserved for our blessing. That, friends, is the creed and the authority of the church, and we can afford to turn to no other. But that's a very bold statement to make, is it not? We live in a world with vast religious creeds. In fact, if I were to go to my office and just pull out the different volumes 
that I have, which by no means exhausts the list. And go in there and just pull out the different volumes that I have that call themselves the creed, the standard, the catechism, the constitution of these particular churches, the stack would be this high. It's a bold statement to make in a world consumed in religious creeds to say that the Bible is the one to which we must turn and we can afford to turn to no other. What is it about the Bible that causes it to stand out and up from all other religious documents that exist in this world today and that have ever existed or that will even come to exist in the future? Now, there are so many things that we could mention this morning, but I want to specify three in particular that I believe identify the Bible as the sole creed and authority of the church of the Bible of which we need to and must be members. And in doing so, we'll easily answer for us the question, what is the difference? Number one, What's the difference with regard to the creed or the authority of the church? Let's begin by looking at the origin of the Bible. Because ultimately, like any other religious work, the origin of the Bible is left to two options. It either has come from God or it has come from man. That's it. There can be no other option. It is either divine in nature or it is mortal in nature. Now, when you read and study and research the Bible, it's very clear what claim the Bible makes because it is evident that the Bible claims and evidences itself that God has spoken to and on behalf of man for the purpose of revealing His will to us. And does that not fit perfectly with the biblical picture of the personal, loving, merciful, caring, graceful God that we serve. Not a God who created us and then just tossed us out into the universe and has no care nor concern for us today. That's nothing more than deism. No, we're talking about a God who did create us in love, but likewise cares for us in His mercy and grace. And friends, that is a God who has revealed His will to us so that we may know what is expected of us. Is that not what Hebrews 1 beginning in verse 1 tells us? That God who at sundry times and in diverse manners in time past spoke unto, uh, 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 unto the fathers by the prophets, but hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son whom He hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Friends, three verses, one point, God has spoken. But while that may be the central point, the writer goes on to demonstrate something inherent in what has been spoken, and that is power. That Son by whom He has spoken has been appointed heir of all things. Friends, that is supreme authority. Just as Jesus Himself had said in Matthew 28, 18, All power hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. But not only has he been appointed heir of all things, but he was likewise the source of power by which the very world has been made. John 1, we find it being said of the incarnate word that by him were all things made. And without him was not anything made that was made. Not only though, 
has He been appointed heir of all things. And not only is it the case that He was the power through whom this world and universe was made, but likewise that it is by that very word of power that all things are up, upheld. Friends, we're not just saying that God has spoken, but we're saying that God has spoken in authority and He has spoken in power. And scriptural testimony states that God spoke as evidence of His love for man and His intention to give us everything that we need to one day eternally enter into His fellowship reconciling ourselves unto the God from whom we were separated because of our sin. However, the reality that God has spoken does not automatically demand that the Bible was the manner by which He spoke. In the minds of the world, they may say, well, we won't dispute the fact that God has spoken, but they may say we do dispute that the Bible is the source through which he spoke. How is it then that we can begin to decipher and decide which of all of the vast religious books in the world that exist, which one is the true book through which God has spoken? Well, we obviously cannot stand here today and decipher and divide uh, and, and dissect each religious book that exi exists in the world. But what we can say is that of all who have taken the time to decipher and dissect all of the vast religious books of the world in this world, those books that even claim some type of supernatural origin, that not a single one has any internal nor external evidence that can support such a claim outside of the Bible. And therefore it and it alone stands up from and apart from any other creed or authority that exists in the world today. And notice just a very few points of evidence though to back that up. Because it's, again, easy for me to stand here and make that claim without providing any evidence. But what evidence is there to support such a claim? Uh, well, first, there is an incredible unity of purpose in the Bible. In that it is a single work comprised of 66 books that from beginning to end were created over 1,600 years by about 40 different writers who all used several languages and covered hundreds of topics. And yet, all of that information still comes together in a unified book without contradiction, without division, without separation. A perfect, unified, pure God. No other book can claim that. And so the Bible stands apart. Second, the Bible is logically defensible. All other religious works in this world are hopelessly contradictory. I've looked into just a very few and it doesn't take too long into reading into them that they simply are not going to stand the test of divine origin. Yet there has never been an, an unexplainable variant in the Word of God. It, again, is a perfectly unified book. Does that mean we understand everything about it? No. But just because we don't understand everything about it does not mean that it is not perfect and unified. It just means we need to study harder. Number three, the Bible displays a superior wisdom over all other religious writings. Uh, for instance, if, you're, if you have ever done any reading or study into the Book of Mormon or into the Quran, each of those two prominent religious books contain historical inconsistencies and changing viewpoints. Uh, when we were privileged to go to Oregon in June and sit down with elders in the Mormon church, they could not even defend the historical inaccuracies in their creed book. 
And yet when you turn to the Bible, you don't find any historical inconsistencies or changing viewpoints. It is a superior wisdom above all other religious writings. Number four, the Bible is historically authentic and has been confirmed by any number of sources with regard to archaeology, uh, history, and various other external sources. But then number five, you consider the fulfilled prophecy of the Bible. Of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies, foretold events from the Old Testament, each and every one of which you find come to fruition in the New. How is it possible that that could be the case? Two such perfect detail each and every time. Not a bold general claim. Like in five years, it's going to rain. Five years later, it rains. Oh, they must have been a prophet. Oh, no. We're talking about detailed prophecy, each coming to fruition according to its minute detail. Friends, there's no other explanation for it outside of divine origin. And when all of this evidence and so much more that could be provided is researched and combined together, the single answer to which we must come, warranted by truth and evidence, is that the Bible's origin is with God. And when we come to that reality, any other question very easily goes away. Second, though, when we ask the question, what's the difference with regard to the creed or the authority of the church of the Bible? Let's not only delve into the origin of the Bible, let's develop a, a thought that we've already briefly mentioned just a little bit more with regard to the oneness of the Bible, the unity of singularity, in other words, of the Bible. John 10 and verse 35, Jesus said that the Scripture cannot be broken. Bold claim. And just because the Bible makes the claim doesn't mean it's necessarily true. Not every claim that has ever been made is necessarily true. But because it makes the claim, that means that we can examine it to see if it is true. What's the conclusion to which we're going to come? Well, ahead of time, I'll tell you, the conclusion to which we will come is that it is true. But let's, for the sake of theory, assume that we don't know. How can we know whether or not the Scripture cannot or has been broken? See, a central message of Jesus' teaching was His insistence that God's Word means exactly what it says and says exactly what it means. It's concrete and it's eternal because that's what truth is. Truth in whatever area or discipline of life, it, if it is actual truth, it is concrete and it is eternal. Truth does not waver. Truth is not wishy-washy. Truth cannot change over time. Truth is truth. It's always been truth, and it is truth now, and it always will be truth. Uh, things like nature are insufficient to meet man's spiritual needs. and It, it can only supply what we need physically. But there is something in man. We may not be able to see it. We may not be able to put our hands on it. But there is something within man that we know from personal experience that cannot be satisfied only by physical sustenance. Jesus would say in John 4 that man has a soul that thirsts for something he called living water. A living water, by the way, that is available only with God. And man cannot benefit from something that is self-contradictory or inwardly divided. And this is where the Bible enters the picture. Because again, its unity is perfect. Its message is one. 
And that is seen in many different areas. Uh, for instance, you see in the Bible a unity in its doctrine. You can read from Genesis to Revelation and never find contradictory statements regarding God's expectation for man in its historical context. The Bible displays standard truth. And truth can never be wrong or divided. John 17, verse 17. Not only is there unity in the Bible's doctrine, there is unity in the Bible's prophecy, which we did mention a moment ago, but we look now from a different perspective in that you remember that in the ministry of Jesus that on a regular basis He challenged the Jews of His day to search the Scriptures? Now to them, what would the Scriptures be? Well, the New Testament was not written when Jesus spoke those words. And so when He told His Jewish audience, search the Scriptures, the only available Scriptures they had were the Old Testament. But when He told them to search the Scriptures, what did He likewise tell them? Search the Scriptures because they testified of Jesus. You have predictive prophecy, perfectly foretold and fulfilled in the Bible, specifically with regard to the Messiah. And again, there can be no other explanation. Number three, there is unity in the Bible's ethics. God's moral standard is universal and it is eternal. Now, the manner by which God's morals and ethics are displayed by law changed from time to time. And by that I mean you have the old law of Moses and the new law of Christ. And you have some different ways by which that law is enacted in our lives. But the standard moral discipline behind that law has not changed. It's still as true and eternal today as it ever has been. There is no divided message when it comes to the Bible's ethics. Number four, there is unity in the Bible's sobriety, meaning this. The Bible prevents, pre presents rather a calm, rational, dignified approach to its material. Not jumping from coldly intellectual or hotly fanatic. The Bible is simply truth presented in a clear and concise package and left for man's reception or refusal. Paul demonstrated that to the Corinthians, did he not? In 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 1, when he said, Now, brethren, when I came to you, I, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God." You see, the way of the world is, let's provide the message, whatever message they want to convey. Let's, con let, let's convey that message in such an eloquent, beautiful, pleasurable package that we possibly can that, that the listeners will not care whether it's truth or not. But it sounds so pretty, they just want to accept it. Paul said, no, when I came to you, I, I didn't come based on excellency of speech or of wisdom. He said, all I came to do was to tell you the truth, period. And it was up to them as to what they would do with it. Well, friends, the same is the case today. The Bible provides truth. And then it leaves it up to us as to whether we're going to accept it or reject it. Now, it obviously pleads with us to accept it, but it leaves the decision solely within our control. There is unity in the Bible's expression. 
See, human writings tend to either over or under emphasize certain things, proving them to be defective. Now, for instance, if you read through the Quran, you'll find an overemphasis on violence. Now, is that a politically correct statement to make? No. Would a lot of people hammer me over the airways if they heard me say that? Yeah. But if you read it for yourself, it's true. The Book of Mormon overemphasizes inaccurate history to a terrible degree. I'm not just picking on those two because you could go to any other religious work and find the same thing. Either an over or under emphasis. But the Bible is perfectly unified in its expression. Uh, there are many other attributes of its unity that we could mention. Uh, but friends, they all still point back to the oneness of the Bible and why that should be the source of our authority and our only creed. But then finally, and very quickly, when you talk about the creed or the authority of the church and ask the question, what's the difference? Uh, let's understand very quickly the objective of the Bible. Uh, we've looked at a lot of, uh, of, of facts, a lot of evidence, but, but you might have this lingering question in your head, what's the point? Uh, you've told us all of this stuff, what's the point? What's the objective of everything that we've just mentioned? Uh, well, the point, friends, is simply this. The Bible is a large collection of books written by many different people from many different backgrounds in a few different languages, touching many different topics and covering many different periods of history. But it has one point. What is the point of the Bible? Redemption. That is it. Regardless of whatever topical theme or historical context in which you read whatever verse you want, it ultimately is pointing to its central purpose. And that is the provision of redemption unto mankind. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10 and verse 23 that he knew the way of man was not in himself. That it was not in man to walk and direct his own steps. And friends, this is a confession that Jeremiah makes that must be made in the life of every single individual if we are ever going to establish and maintain a proper relationship with God. It begins with the reality that I am personally insufficient and that there is someone, God, to whom I must cleave in order to be able to walk aright. Now, now, that does not mean that man is inherently evil. I'm not saying that. That's pure Calvinism. But it does mean that when man of his own weakness falls into evil, that we are wholly incapable of self-deliverance. This is where the Bible comes into play. Because while self-deliverance is not possible, it is not necessary either. I, I can't direct my own steps, and I don't have to worry about that because God does not expect me to direct my own steps. He's provided me the, the guide by which I can direct my steps. Matthew 5 and verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. God has provided a book that can do many things for us. Jesus just said that it can fill us. In John 1, 16 and 17, it is said that of His fullness we have all received and grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Not only will the Word of God fill us, but it will provide us grace and truth. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. It will not only fill us and provide us grace and truth, it will complete us 
But is that not the very thing that Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16? Of the Word of God that is inspired, that is able to perfect or complete us, providing us redemption that will ultimately save our souls, Romans 1.16. That, friends, is the objective of the Bible. It has no political objective. It has no social objective outside of providing social morality and standard. Its objective is pure and simple. It is spiritual and it is salvation. And that makes the Bible stand out from any other religious book that has, does, or will ever exist. It is our creed. It is our authority. And it is to it and it alone we must turn for the direction we so desperately need in our lives. Have you submitted to its counsel and commands this morning? Have you allowed it to direct your steps according to the will of God and not according to the steps of any man, any institution, but simply of Jehovah God of heaven? If not, why not this morning make the decision to believing the Bible and particularly believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Repent of your sin, confess your faith, and be immersed in water to have your sins washed away. You can do that, and we plead with you to do it today. Maybe you've done that in the past, but, but since time you've allowed some other influences to draw you away from God and from His will. But now you're on the outside looking in and realize your current state. Why not make the decision to come back? Repenting of those sins, confessing them, praying unto God for forgiveness, and He'll forgive you. Cleanse you of all of your unrighteousness and remember your sins and your iniquities no more. But friends, it's dependent on our perspective of this book. What's the difference with regard to the creed of the church, the authority of the church? The conclusion is the same. It's an eternal difference. So why not allow the Bible to make an eternal difference in your life today? If you need to, come even now while together we stand and sing.